Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. We're here again. Give thanks and praise. Um, what a beautiful privilege to be invited to observe uh, our Creator's Moedim and uh, not just the um, the feast that sets up, but to do it weekly, Shabbat. You know, it's almost like out in the world, people renew the the marriage vows, don't they? Usually about every seven years, and it feels like we do it weekly. Well, what a what a beautiful privilege. Um, so today we're on Pasha Vayera, Vayera, which in English is translated as And I Appeared. And we'll be going from uh, chapter 6, verse 2, all the way to 9.35. We'll actually read from chapter 6, verse 1, just so we sort of hit the ground running. Because it's, uh, yeah, so we're going to do it that way. So where are we up to? Let's have a look at the review uh, of... What we've heard previously, to bring this into today. Last part uh, was Shemot. Uh, we heard that last week. And um, does anybody remember what happened last week in Joe's Parsha? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Um, you're all off the hook. Uh, Moses has encounters with Yeshua. Remember? Um, he he put the, to death the Egyptian within him. Uh, it's very symbolic. And, and, events he had, um, he flees to a well and has a born again experience. And we also read how our Lord and Saviour Yeshua is the only way out of the matrix. Yeah, powerful Pasha it was. So let's preview today. Um, Pasha Vayera and I appeared, I being our God. Yeah. This Pasha sees where Moses repeatedly exhorts uh, Pharaoh to permit God's children to worship God. Uh, for me, this part it could be called "Let us worship our God," um, or it could even be called "I appeared and someone disappeared," because um, someone gets disappeared off today. Uh, and we're going to see what happens when you mess with God's children. Uh, God doesn't like blasphemy, and He doesn't like people messing with His children with His land. Uh, we're going to see instances of that today and we'll see what happens if you think you can usurp your hey vav hey uh, but before we read there's a bit of background on what's what this passage involves as i said earlier um, it covers the first seven uh, signs and wonders the first seven plagues so to speak um but what what appear what seems to look what looks like chaos is in fact uh, a divinely organised, um, systematic act of God. If we set aside the tenth uh, sign, the tenth plague, which is usually regarded as a distinct event in itself, and we look at the first nine plagues, there's a, a, an organised pattern within them that only God could uh, design, um, and that they happen to be in threes which is uh, quite significant. Um, plagues 1, 4 and 7, i.e. the water into blood, the swarms of flies and the hail. All these occur after Moses warns Pharaoh in the morning. So that's acts, uh, acts of God, 1, 4 and 7, they all occur after Moses warns Pharaoh in the morning. The next set of three acts Plague 2, 5 and 8, the frogs, the livestock and the locusts. All these occur after Moses warns Pharaoh in his palace. The third set, plagues 3, 6 and 9, the gnats, the boils and the darkness. All these occur after no warning. Um, and there are more patterns of design within these um, signs and wonders, but I just wanted to... That should suffice for now, but there are more if you want to study them out. Basically, God's judgment and his justice, his justice is orderly. It's not random or chaotic. If you were in Egypt at the time, you think all kind of bedlam was let loose. But it's, it's God's doings and it's, it's organised. It's designed. It has an order. Now, as I said at the outset, um, we see Pharaoh in this, in this Parsha. 
being quite, um, he's in denial, he's quite defiant. He's just blatantly anti-God. He will not bow. He's very stubborn. He's arrogant. He's proud. He's, we're going to see that. And then non-believers and skeptics will say, well, didn't your God harden Pharaoh's heart and therefore just remove his free will? You know, um, wasn't God harsh and unfair with Pharaoh, sitting like some kind of puppet? And we know, all, all of us here sitting here, we know that God is not over severe at all. And that the blame obviously lies with Pharaoh. Pharaoh, at least five or six, I think five, maybe six times, it was self-inflicted. He made his own heart heavy. It's written in the text. He made his own heart heavy. And eventually Pharaoh became beyond redemption. He, he inflicted it upon himself. He became beyond redemption. And whereby Pharaoh makes his heart heavy, God then merely hardens it or strengthens it. I, he permit, God permits Pharaoh his free will to do so with his own heart. He allows all of us, he allows all of us the desires of our own hearts. This is what God, God does in his uh, amazing wisdom. Uh, there's a biblical scholar there, Dennis Prager, and I want to quote him here. He said, Strengthening Pharaoh's heart is precisely what gave Pharaoh free will. So skeptics and non-believers may say, no, your God wasn't fair with them. Our God was more than fair with them. Whatever happened to Pharaoh, he inflicted upon himself. So you're saying that um, ultimately when it speaks about the Lord hardening his heart, it's uh, idiomatic for the Lord actually granting him further free will yeah. and permitting him to actually enact exactly. his own... That's exactly what I'm saying, brother. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. So for me, and for most of us here, well, for all of us here, Pharaoh rendered himself unredeemable. He took himself beyond the reach, the scope of repentance. Uh, like Hasatan, much like Hasatan, the devil. And in my opinion, Pharaoh wasn't only a picture of Hasatan, but actually was him. That's what I'm going to try and portray today. Or go some way towards that. We know in, the, in life that some sins are, are bad, but some are so unforgivably bad. And some, some deeds are so without redemption that there has to be some kind of justice meted out. And it must be so because our God is just and he is righteous. You often cite that... Um, wasn't it the war veteran who said, I couldn't believe it in a God who wasn't just, just unrighteous? Mm -hmm. When we see such despicable acts of violence and evil, we wouldn't, it wouldn't sit right with us if our God did not deal with that in a just way. Mm -hmm. Repentance under such circumstances would allow those who, who deserve punishment, it had allowed them to escape the consequences of the, the pain and the misery and the severe suffering that they've inflicted on others through their evil, heinous deeds. That can't be right. We're talking about diabolic deeds. We know how the world is. And Pharaoh was one of these. And God hates evil. Like Hasatan, Pharaoh was all self. It was all self. To the detriment of others, including his own subjects on the land and his family, he was totally selfish. He let them all suffer. Our Saviour, our Lord Yeshua, it's the total opposite. He's fully selfless. He's fully selfless, Yeshua. Pharaoh is all self <clears throat> and ego. He's arrogant. He's proud. He's lofty. He's hateful. Whereas Yeshua teaches, love God, love your neighbour as yourself. Be humble. Pharaoh hates God and he even hates his own people. He's the total opposite. He's at the other end. <clears throat> He's the agent of his own downfall. And of course, he did have freedom of choice. I refer you to Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life god wouldn't say choose unless we were had free will god gives everyone choice 
Now we know there's only one Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, but there are many Antichrists. We read this in First John, there are many Antichrists. Off the top of my head I can think of Pharaoh, Caesar, Herod, Stalin, Hitler, there's many. And for me, an Antichrist is the devil incarnate. He's the devil incarnate. He's a blasphemer. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. He's a murderer. He's one who attempts to deny and to defy God. And Pharaoh, just like Hasatan, has all these characteristics. He develops all these traits. In the first book of Exodus, the first book of Shemot, we're told, now there arose a new king over Egypt, king over the world, who did not know Joseph. Where it says he doesn't know, Jack touched on this as well, where it says he doesn't know, it means he didn't regard him, he did, dismisses him, pays no attention to him. I don't recognise you, basically, is what he's saying. Doesn't acknowledge him, doesn't see him having any authority, basically. And we all know that Joseph, in that episode, is a foreshadowing of Yeshua. Mm. So Pharaoh is basically saying that he rejects Yeshua. Yeah. This is what we're being shown in the scriptures. And again, in chapter 5 of Shemot of Exodus, and Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, and I won't let Israel go. So he's declaring who he is and where he stands. Exodus 4. And this was, um, this was a demonstration that God gave to Moses and Aaron in order that the children of Israel would believe that God had sent Moses. I... For those who belong, who wish to belong to God, this is the criteria. It's written here in Exodus 4. So the Lord said to him, what's that in your hand? And he said, a rod. God said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it and it became a rod in his hand that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, Now put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. God said, Put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom again, and drew it out of his bosom, and behold, it was restored like his other flesh. Then it will be, if they do not believe you, nor heed the message of the first sign, that they may believe the message of the latter sign. And it shall be, if they do not believe even these two signs, or listen to your voice, that you shall take water from the river and pour it on a dry land, the water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry land. Now to me this is quite explicit here and quite powerful. He says, reach out your hand and um, take the rod, uh, the serpent by the tail. This, this is a picture of Yeshua who conquers the serpent. Where he puts his hand in and becomes dead. First it's alive, then it's dead, then it's alive again. This is Yeshua. He takes on our sins. He takes our sins to the grave and he rises alive. He's visible, he's invisible, he's visible but again. It all points to Yeshua. Remember in Revelation... I am he who lives, was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. It all points to him. This here, what we read, it's the two signs. It's Yeshua's first and second advent. And then we have the Moses' voice, the Torah. The absence of which leads to death. That's where the blood on the dry land is. And this is the criteria for belonging to God. It's Yeshua. It's the Torah. And elsewhere we see that the prophets are also included. This is the criteria, not only for us, but for rulers of the world, for everyone, including rulers like Pharaoh. And this is what he totally denied and tried to defy. We all choose, we all choose our own destiny. Pharaoh was destined for hell. And like Hasatan, he's a murderer and a liar. 
another apologetic. Ah, oh, but doesn't your God made the people in the Old Testament? No, he doesn't. And he cannot, because that would be against his own doctrine. We see in the Sixth Commandment, um, thou shalt not kill. Some translations say thou shalt not kill. But that's not quite the truth. It's thou shalt not murder. The word is rasach. Rasach in the Hebrew. God does kill. God gives life and take, taketh life. But he does not murder. There's a difference. The Hebrew word for kill, in thou shalt not kill, really means murder. Or to kill unlawfully or with, with wicked intent. And Yeshua himself quotes it in Matthew. Matthew 19, you shall not murder. God never made us. His own doctrine forbids murder. So does God violate the sixth commandment when he takes life? No, he doesn't. Does God kill? Yes, he does. He giveth and he taketh away. Does God murder? No, no, never. Our God is loving, is good, is righteous, merciful, compassionate, long-suffering, holy, wise, and just. It's as simple as, God would never extinguish the life of one created in his image without justification. Ezekiel 33, As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. NIV version. Now sometimes it's necessary for one's own good or for the greater good of others. Um, for death to enter the scene. Sometimes death is necessary for one's own good or for the greater good of others. I remember once, um, a few years ago, I was quite horrified. Close to where I live, there's a butcher's at the top of the street, in fact, and it's quite famous. They make, um, they're, they're famous for making scouse pie. Um, and we were talking about it, a friend of mine was talking about it because he used to live practically next door to me. And he goes, oh yeah, blah, blah, blah. I used to get me scouse pie from there, blah, 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 blah. And out the blue, he said, um, yeah, um, and he named the butcher. He said, uh, he stabbed a dog to death outside the shop. And I'm like, Oof, gosh. I thought, he, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking like, I'm just thinking nice images of scouse pie, etc. And he's talking about this butcher stabbed the, to death a dog outside his own shop. And for a moment I was horrified and I thought, oof, I thought what the, why? <coughs> Apparently it, it pounced on a pram and was, was attacking her baby. You know, I'm sure he tried to just pull her off her face and it was, it's a matter of time before you've got to save the baby. So he's had to kill the dog, you know. Um, I do a lot of painting and decorating. Um, and sometimes when we're painting outside, especially in the warmer months, You've just painted the wall and next minute a, 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 an insect lands on it as so you try to get the insect off or a, a spider comes down and she's stuck in the paint and it's full of paint and you go, oh, and you're trying to get the paint off and it, the spider's struggling and you're thinking, oh God, please just, just save the spider or, and you can't, you're trying to help him. And the most merciful thing you can do sometimes is just to kill the spider. You know, it's a horrible feeling just having to do it and pray and say, Lord, take us all, please. But the point being, that's not murder. Sometimes death is necessary for one's own good or for the good of others. Going back to Pharaoh, um, through the departure the here and, pre, and the subsequent passes, you see that where it says Pharaoh's heart became hardened or was strengthened, etc. Many cases, it, it's not, it, it's not Hazach. It's not the word hazak. In many cases, it's kabad or kabed, which means heavy, weighty, burdensome, and it can even mean honoured. Right? So we, once you get to see in the English, it doesn't really do it justice. In fact, it's quite misleading. In effect, Pharaoh dulls and makes his heart heavy, and then God honours it. He permits it. And he will do with all of us. 
And as we saw earlier, God's strengthening of Pharaoh's heart is precisely what gave Pharaoh free will. Okay, we're going to start reading now, but I just wanted to dispense with the apologetics and also to outline the character of Pharaoh uh, to show why God took him out. No one's going to say, oh, God's unfair to remove Hasitan from the scene. No one's going to say that. Well, the same applies with Pharaoh, and I just wanted to outline that. Okay, so we're going to start reading the Parsha, chapter 6, Exodus, Shemot. Anything to add, lads? You okay? Um, now, I know the Parsha begins at verse 2, but just so we're hitting the ground running, I'm going to start it from verse 1. I'm going to read just to verse 13. So, 1 to 13. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will let them go, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. And God said to Moses, and God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am your hey vav hey. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, yod hey vav hey, I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them, to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, in which they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am yod hey vav hey. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. I am your hey, vav hey. So Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel, but they didn't heed Moses because of anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Go in, tell Pharaoh king of Egypt to let the children of Israel go out of his land. And Moses spoke before the Lord saying, The children of Israel have not heeded me. How then shall Pharaoh heed me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a command for the children of Israel and for Pharaoh king of Egypt to bring the children of Israel out of the la land of Egypt. A great start of the Parsha. It sets the scene. And I know it starts at verse 2, but I'd like to refer back to verse 1 here. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will let them go. With a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. God's will will be done. God's will will always be done. Whoever you are, however mighty you might think you are, and this strong hand here is God's hand. The strong hand is God's. It's not Pharaoh's, it's God's. God's will cannot be thwarted. You can work with him or against him. His will will be done. That strong hand there is God's. Verse 2. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am, I, I am yod hey vav hey. Now I heard our sister Eli speaking about this um, just before we began. Because um, she says to the the previous patriarchs, they didn't know me by this name, and apparently, well, it's in scriptures it says he does. Now, there's, there's much speculation and there's many theories over this. Maybe God's telling Moses that he will now come to fully understand the meaning and the character of yod hey vav -Hey in a way that wasn't available to the previous patriarchs. Um, I've got my own answer, and it, it's this. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not really sure. That's my answer. I really don't know. But it's one for us, it's one for us all to go and research. I do have a little theory. Yod hey vav hey is made up of three letters. The yod, the vav and the hey. And with those three letters in the Hebrew you can spell was, is and will be. 
So you got the the the, the, the eternal Father there. You know, his in in his name was, is, and will be. And the previous patriarchs may not have realised they was past, present, and future. I don't know. It's just it's just speculation. But um, I think it can also be viewed of the attributes of him. So his he's character. Re he's revealed himself, yeah. but he's not re revealed vengeance and justice and intervention Fully. and retribution. Fully. Now he's going to enact yeah. retribution, yeah. vengeance, yeah. and we're going to see another side of his character, which is yeah. the judge. I go, so far as I, my understanding is, I go along with that brother. So I said here, maybe God is telling Moses that he will now to come to fully understand the meaning and character yeah. of Yahweh in a way that wasn't available to the previous mm -hmm. patriarchs. Mm -hmm. But it, it, in all honesty, I'm not really sure either way, but neither a thousand of biblical scholars. But yeah, go and research it, people. It's a wonderful study. I've got a theory, because it's similar to what Joe was saying. It's As we sort of move through the text in the Bible, his character is getting revealed more and more. Yeah. And by the time we get to Yeshua, you know, thou shalt not murder. Um, is, is, um, you know, it's a lot more deeper, isn't it, than yeah. that? Yeah. So it's like, it's a fair, like, like you're saying, it's a further revelation. So like Yeshua is a greater understanding of, of of how we interpret God, yeah. So I, I would I would go along with that too. It's it's it's. it's so you're saying that through time, mm -hmm. he's revealing so gradually, yeah. and it's gradually more and more gradually, yeah. Between him and his people. Yeah, beautiful. I think I go on a similar lines. Thanks for the uh, verse six five here. And I've also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I've remembered my covenant. God never forgets, and God always keeps his promises. If we refer back to, I'll read it out, Genesis 13. God speaking to Abraham, before he was named Abraham. He says, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in the land that is not theirs, and will save them, and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nations whom they save, I will judge. So this year, verse 5, I've heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, I remembered my covenants. That covenant was spoken 400 years previously to Abraham. And incessantly mentioning 400 years of affliction, as I said, this was given 400 years previously. And this is why the sages date the bondage and the slavery of the Israelites to that prophecy. They date it from then. When God spoke that to Abraham, up until this point, it was 400 years, and that's where they date it from. Because you get people saying, well, wasn't that about 200, 200 odd years, or nearer to such and such a figure? This is where the sages get the 400 years from, from that pro prophecy given to Abraham, which God says, I have remembered. Verse 9, chapter 6. So Moses spoke, spoke thus to the children of Israel, but they didn't heed Moses because of anguish of spirit, and cruel bondage. Now there's several translations. This anguish of spirit, it means shortness of breath or shortness of spirit. Wow. Ruach, it's ruach. It can mean wind, breath, spirit, as we know. But this anguish of spirit is shortness of breath and spirit. And then the cruel bondage, that's cruel toil, cruel labor, slavery, basically. But why is it written that way round? Shortness of breath, cruel bondage. You'd think it'd be the other way round. You think about it, you're under cruel bondage, so you've got shortness of breath, lack of spirit. It's because when we don't shema the Torah, when we don't shema the word of God, life does become a toil. That's why it's written that way around. If we don't live spiritual lives, we will be in bondage. You see? So, scripture's always written perfectly by the finger of God to to give a message or everything. Well, why isn't it written that way? Yeah. It's just that it leads to the cruel bondage. Thank you, brother. Exactly. You say it better than me. Well, you do. Yeah, so shortness of spirit leads to heavy burdens. You know. Second Timothy. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work as we as we know we don't live by bread alone 
And his burden, his burden is light. We reap what we sow. Now we refer back to the sixth act of God, the sixth plague. It was it boils. Um, boil or an eruption in the Hebrew Shechin. <laughs> uh, Shechin. Uh, now these boils are on the outside, but they're also inside the people. They're on the outside and on the inside. It's a, an outward manifestation of the inner person. This Shechin, this boil, this eruption is also a consumption of the lungs. So I, you got trouble. This is going to give you trouble within your lungs. And it's funny how, just relating to the shortness of breath, that which Pharaoh and his followers inflicted upon God's people returned to them. We all reap what we sow. Verse 11 and 13. Go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the children of Israel go out of his land. And then it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, verse 13, and gave them a command for the children of Israel and for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. It said, wasn't it just to the wilderness? God saying, tell them, come out of the land of Egypt. And even in chapter 3, verse 10, God says, Come now therefore, and I will send to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And in chapter 5, the very first verse, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go. They don't say out of Egypt, out of your land. But that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Over and over to say the same thing. Over and over to Pharaoh. Pharaoh was never told the fullness by Moses and Aaron. They never actually said to Pharaoh, no, we want to leave your land. We're not coming back. They just said, oh, we're just going to go three days into the wilderness to worship our God. So he's thinking, oh, no, you're only going to come back. So you still be our slaves. They never, ever told Pharaoh the fullness of what God told them. If they would have knew the fullness, they would have, would have never crucified our Lord of glory. Oh, beautiful, <laughs> beautiful, <laughs> beautiful. But um, he asked this, he said, well, why? Why did, did they keep it from them? Were they being shrewd? Were they, you know? Um, but as I said, people, it's, there's another study. You know, there's so many, such riches in the scriptures. You can just study for yourself. I could come up with conjecture, but um, why listen to me? You can study for yourselves. Yeah. It's almost like an example, like how much do we share with Egypt as well? Like once you make a contract with Egypt in your life, in your finances, in your job, like even we can, you talked about it on the podcast, how much do you share with your parents that are in the world? Because sometimes the less the world knows, the better, but mm. rather good stuff. Yeah. But you have to be shrewd in what you share with Egypt, you know? Mm. Yeah. That was powerful. I, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't add to that whole takeaway. Thanks, sis. It's powerful. It's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, we're on chapter seven. Just before you go, chapter seven. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. It, it's so real, though, isn't it? Because you can talk yourself into trouble. And, yeah. like, if you think powerful. of like, Joseph, you know, with his dream and what you was bringing a couple of parshas ago, he talked himself into trouble of, like, Oh, the end goal is I'm going to yeah. rule over you. Yeah. So it rings true, yeah. even with our brothers and sisters, you know, yeah. and the world. It's like, look, you know, some things that God's told you yeah. is that's just the relationship yeah. between you and God and yeah. things in the world. Of course, if, if, if you're in need or in danger, sometimes, you know, I'm not saying that you shouldn't share, but there's, there's that yeah. discernment. Yeah, something. I think you're right. I think it's wisdom because yeah. only Moses, Aaron and the elders knew. Because they were the ones who went in on and did the knowledge that they're coming out of the land. It's only Moses, Aaron and the elders. I think it was wisdom and the same not to tell them the full story. Um, like we say repeatedly, don't we? It's, um, it's wisdom to know what to say, when to say and what not to say and when to say nothing. Okay, we're on chapter 7. Um, once again, I'm just going to read, funny enough, up to verse 13. 
So chapter 7, verses 1 to 13, we're going to read here now. So the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and that and your brother shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and Aaron your brother shall tell Pharaoh to send the children of Israel out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh will not heed you, so that I may lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. The Moses and Aaron did so, just as the Lord commanded them, so they did. And Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, when Pharaoh speaks to you saying, show a miracle for yourselves, then you shall say to Aaron, take your rod, cast it before Pharaoh, let it become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh, and they did so, just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. But Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. So the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For every man threw down his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. And Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he didn't heed them, as the Lord had said. Before I go to uh, verse 1, I want to briefly look at verse 3. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. Now, we spoke about this before, but just for those online. As I said, these signs and wonders are often referred to as plagues, but the two translation is given here, signs and wonders, and in another place it's judgments. It's not plagues. So forgive me when I do say plagues, but it's signs and wonders. It's sign, which is out, and wonder, which is mofet. So it's otot and mofetim in the plural, signs and wonders. Verse 12 and 13 here before we go back to the first verse. But Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sources. So the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For every man threw down his rod and they became serpents, but Adam's rod swallowed up their rods. And so what basically I want to make the point here, that there's a picture going on once again. The staff, Moses, Aaron, they represent the word of God. The serpents, the staffs of the wizards, they represent Hasatan and his followers. It's all a picture of good over evil. That's what's happening in that scenario. Right, I want to return to the first verse here, seven one. So the Lord said to Moses, See, I've made you as God of, of God to Pharaoh, and that and your brother shall be your prophet. Now, depending on which version you read, which translation, is it God with a capital G or is it a God? I have made you as God to Pharaoh, or as a God to Pharaoh. It's not quite, it's hard to distinguish which is which. So is it God or is it a God? Well, there's another study for everybody. But here for me, you see, Pharaoh's given yet another opportunity to see sense and to come to his senses. He's faced with two godly, humble men right in front of him who offer him a way out. They offer him the opportunity to heed God and yet he opts for the route to hell of his own free will, just like Hasatan. And I want to refer you to Luke 16 to uh, enforce this. There was a certain man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. He lived, lived luxuriously, basically. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, <coughs> desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. 
Then he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tongue of his finger in water and cure my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed. So that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Amen. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, If they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Wow. And here now, Lazarus represents Israel and the multitude that follow out Israel. The rich man is Pharaoh. And in verse 31, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Moses, the Torah, the prophet is Aaron. Yeshua is the one coming back from the dead, that's God. Moses is a God in Pharaoh's eyes and Aaron is the prophet in Pharaoh's eyes. So he's, he's sealed his own destiny. And that, uh, that story of Lazarus there is, is, is quite... Uh, very applicable to Pharaoh. We read in Mark 8, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world? Now Pharaoh ruled the world and loses his own soul. Mm -hmm. Pharaoh, like the devil, had the whole world but forfeited his soul. Pharaoh, the rich man, rejects Yeshua, Moses, the Torah and the prophets. Hasatan rejects Yeshua, Moses, the Torah and the prophets. It's one and the same to me. Yeshua is returning to wipe out evil. Pharaoh was evil and chose to be wiped out. Now let's just delve for a moment into the world that Pharaoh lived in. I got this off a site called Ancient Art. It should be Ancient Heart or Pharaoh's Heart. Ancient Art. The ancient Egyptians believed that the soul resided inside the heart, but the organ's exact role to bodily function wasn't fully understood. Despite not knowing its physiological importance, they knew the heart played a central role in the bodily and spiritual operation of the individual. The multitude of heart-shaped amulets recovered in Egypt also confirms the significance of the heart to the spiritual conscience. And besides being worn in life, the amulets were also employed during mummification and put in between the wrappings in order to, to further protect the dead during their journey in the underworld. During the mummification process, the brain was famously removed through the nose, whereas the heart was left inside the body as the deceased would have needed it once they entered the duat, the realm of the dead, so-called ruled by Osiris. Here, a ceremony was enacted to determine the fate of the soul of the deceased. Once they had undertaken their journey through the underworld, the souls of the dead arrived at the Hall of Ma'at, where the ceremony of the weighing of the heart took place. The weighing of the heart. The first part of the ritual consisted in the deceased addressing each of the 42 judges, or Ren, by their name, and reciting all the sins that he or she had not committed in their life. Surely it's had or had not committed, anyway. After this test, needing to confirm their purity and freedom of sin, the deceased presented their heart to the balance where various gods performed the ceremony. The jackal-headed Anubis was usually involved in administering the test, while Ibis-headed Thoth recorded the result. The heart was weighed against the feather of Ma'at, the goddess who fittingly represented truth, balance, justice and harmony. If the heart successfully balanced with the feather, the deceased was presented to Osiris and granted access to the Seket Aru, or the Field of Reeds. Here the souls would live eternally in heavenly paradise. 
On the contrary, if the heart was heavier than the feather, meaning the deceased was impure and weighted with sin, it would have been devoured by the demonic goddess Amit, a composite beast of lion, hippo and crocodile. The soul would be destroyed forever, condemning the deceased to eternal restlessness and agony in the duat. Pharaoh continually made his own heart heavy. So even by his own tenets, he had condemned himself. God wasn't to blame. Pharaoh condemned himself. And I will pause there and then. Lava de un café con Dios. So much um, alone. Hopefully, um, we're trying to muse and um, and speak with each other about uh, what we read in the first um, half of the parsha. Um, and by the end of the parsha, I hope it's uh, enlightening and a, and a blessing to to everyone. So let's continue. We're now on chapter eight. We're going to start on verse fifteen. But once Pharaoh saw that there was relief. He hardened his heart and didn't heed them, as the Lord had said. So Pharaoh hardened his heart, but in the Hebrew, as I stated before, this word is kabad or kabed, it means made heavy. It was heavy. He made it heavy. And uh, we looked at before the break, um, what that would mean in ancient Egypt. And he would have been aware of that as well. Uh, and it says here, he wouldn't listen to the voice of reason which is one of the surest signs of pride. When you cannot listen to reason, it's a sure sign of pride, like you know it all. Don't tell me, etc. Um, the humble, and for example, Moses here, uh, will receive correction willingly. It's a lesson for us all. Uh, but a person with pride immediately becomes defensive and won't listen to others. And this will lead to the person's own downfall. We read it in Proverbs, don't we? Uh, Proverbs 16, in fact. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit, a proud spirit, before a fall. And uh, as mentioned, note the contrast between Pharaoh, all ego, all self, all pride, and Moses, who's the most humble man on the earth at the time. Where well, it says here in verse 15, Pharaoh makes his own heart heavy and would not heed them. In other words, he would not shema. He wouldn't shema God, he wouldn't shema the Torah or the prophets. And he remembered that Moses and Aaron were a God and a prophet in his eyes. So there was no excuse for Pharaoh. There was no excuse at all. Um, God made Moses and Aaron a God and a prophet in his eyes. And he still wouldn't listen. Verse 19, then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. So even his own aides were showing him, look, this is, this is God, Pharaoh, this is God. And once again, Pharaoh's heart grew hard and he didn't heed them, just as the Lord had said. So here, what's happening is, where Pharaoh's heart grew hard, now God has strengthened and honoured his own heart's desire. What we see there in verse 15, Pharaoh made his heart heavy and God honours it. That's what's happened. Now his own aides tell him, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh, through his own free will, chooses to ignore it. And as a side note, this finger of God, it should, it should have let your mind say to, right, to, to Luke, the book of Luke, uh, chapter 11. And this is Yeshua speaking. He says, And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. 
So those that were testing the issue were there in that episode, those that were testing them, as soon as he said that, they would have recognised straight away that reference to the book of Exodus, Shemot, in, in the Torah. They would, mentally, they would have thumbed the pages right to that episode um, with Pharaoh's magicians yeah, and his aides. And they would have understood there and then that Yeshua represented God and they themselves represented the devil. Uh, verse 20. Rise, uh, and the Lord said to Moses, Rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh as he comes out to the water. Now, Pharaoh was in the water daily because he would have been given the um, worship to the false deities, whatever the deities of the Nile was in their eyes. That's why he was always there. He was put, hey, sober. there you go, thank you. Yeah, it would have been Sobek, um, and maybe others, but at least Sobek. He would have been there to worship Sobek. He's in the water, he's in the Nile, and he's there every day. So Pharaoh is in denial. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. You can, I'm sorry. No, I say it again. Everyone laugh. Right? You ready? After three. One, two, three. So Pharaoh was in denial. Ah, oh. <laughs> oh, the old, the, the, the old ones are best. Verse twenty-two, twenty-three. In that day, I will set apart, set apart the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there, in order that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the land. I will make a difference between my people and your people. By the way, where it says swarms of flies, in the actual text, the original text, it just says swarms. Flies is just inferred, yeah. It's um, a robe, a robe just means swarms. And it's actually, it's from, it comes from the root word Arab, which is related to Arabia and also means mixed multitudes. Mm. You know, it's very interestingly, but that's another subject. Um, but back to the point, amid all this apparent bedlam, God has the power to distinguish and separate and protect his own. That's his people, the land. And uh, we all see it, in the, we see it again uh, with the livestock in the next chapter, by the way. Uh, the livestock of the Israelites and the livestock of the Egyptians. Uh, he, he separates. And it's the same now, people. It's the same right now. This isn't something that that's God's done in the past and that's it. He does it now. He was with us and it's to come. And he will do it in the end times. You know. He separates his people off from the world. And he, he can protect us, the sheep and the goats, he can protect us, he can redeem us, he can separate us, keep us apart. So all of this, this episode is thousands of years old, it applies today and tomorrow. Verse 25. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Go, sacrifice to your God in the land. Notice he doesn't say in the wilderness, in the land. In other words, we'll go, we will let you worship your God, but in a way that we tell you how to. I'll dictate how you worship your God. Does it sound familiar? Just as now, yeah. um, "Twas ever thus" is one of my favourite sayings. "Twas ever thus," and it happens again. By the way, after the plague of darkness in the next parsha. So, referring back to this verse twenty-five. Go, sacrifice to your God in the land. So, Pharaoh, the contemporary ruler of the world, offers them the freedom or the liberty to sacrifice to God as long as they kept within the land under his jurisdiction. Yeah. Right? Under his terms and under his conditions, yeah. basically. In other words, yeah, you can be Hebrew if you want, but um, don't cast off the yoke of darkness, like... Uh, don't break the link of your connection with sin. Um, don't break all your links with the world. Basically what's happening here is that Pharaoh, just like Hasatan, will allow us to sacrifice to God as long as we still remain his slaves. He wants it done his way. And he'll kid you. He'll trick you. Verse 28. 
So Pharaoh said, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you shall not go very far away. And then he has the goal to say, intercede for me. But in other words, if you must go beyond the band, my boundaries, I'll let you go, but don't go so far away as to be out of sight. I, I want to see what you're up to. I want to oversee you. It's my terms and conditions. Yeah. Just real quick, brother. You know what yeah. how he says, you can go, but don't go too far away from me yeah. and intercede for me. Yeah. He's making their worship about him. Yeah. Stay in my vicinity, stay within yeah, my reach, yeah, yeah. and make your worship also about me. You see for me, yeah. And again, we see that with that synchronicity of Hasatan actually installing the worship of him inside at the children of God. Excellent observation, thanks, brother. And unfortunately, even today, we can all see it in our own lives. Too many people seem to accept these conditions, people, yeah. you know? And try to live a, decide to live like a, a Judeo-Christian life, but with the eyes and the heart still on the world. Mm. And we're looking here, now we're coming out. He's saying, I'm going to do all this now, I want you coming out. Don't listen to Pharaoh, you listen to me and you do it this way. No terms and conditions, come out, right? So a lot of people say, yeah, well, uh, you know, yeah, I believe all that, but... And then they're still stuck in the world's ways, with their eyes and their hearts still on it. You hear people saying, look, well, yeah, we do the Torah, but we, we do Christmas as well, like, it's just for the kids. Uh, look, all right, we do Easter eggs, but we're not harming anyone. Uh, yeah, we do gather to worship, yeah, we do, but on a Sunday, like, the, we've been told by the world's rulers. Yeah. Hang on, no, no, come on, look. Oh, I, yeah, I always say if God set apart day to Shab Shabbat, but on terms that suit me. Uh, sometimes I work if they need the money, like, it, sometimes I, I might just change the time of observance to fit around my schedule. Look, which it's all, it's compromise, it's mixture, it's wrong. Look, if you're in China, you'd observe the Shabbat from sunset to sunset in China. If you're in the Democratic Republic of Congo, it means you reserve the Shabbat from sunset to sunset in the Democratic Republic of Congo. If you're in the UK, you reserve the Shabbat from sunset to sunset in the UK. What if the, you're in Greenland? The day, then it's <laughs> 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 the day begins at sunset, wherever we are, and God tells us that in Genesis. By the way, the Democratic Republic of Congo, you might see it written as DR Congo. It's not a doctor, by the way, it's a country. It's not, it's not Dr. Congo. It, it is a, it's a really, I've seen people saying, you mean Dr. Congo? I said, no, that's, what are you reading? It's a country. DR Congo. Basically, don't listen to the world. Listen to God. The enemy tries to make us compromise. If you can't make it cease all together, you make it try and make it compromise. Yeah. Don't mix our faith with Pharaoh's conditions. We don't want mixture, we don't do mixture. Don't allow this world, don't allow Pharaoh has a time to make you look warm. You don't want to be spat out. That's what mixture is, hot and cold mixed. You don't want to be spat out. Let's do it God's way. I'm going to move on to chapter 9. I'm going to look at verse 4 here. And the Lord will make a difference between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt. So nothing shall die of all that belongs to the children of Israel. Now we just mentioned this, haven't we? Where he separates, protects, redeems. God made a distinction between Israel and Egypt. While all the cattle of Egypt died, not one of Israel's cattle died. And then... Continuing with what we know there, verse 6. So the Lord dis did this thing on the next day, and all the livestock of Egypt died. But of the livestock of the children of Israel, not one died. And then in verse 10, it's reverting to livestock again. Can anyone read verse 10 out? Then they took ashes from the furnace and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses scattered them toward heaven. And they caused boils that broke, break out in sores on man and beast. 
So you think, well, hang on, I thought all the beast, all the cattle was wiped out. I've just seen it in verse 4 and verse 6, and here now it says, on oh, man and beast. And um, I checked the interpretations, it means cattle as well. Just, you know, it's the same word. <coughs> you can use a couple of words, but it means the same thing. Now, for me, there have been a few explanations offered for this. Say, well, the livestock are wiped out, but now they're talking about the livestock being alive and they've got boils. Uh, but for me, it's it's quite simple. It's what we learn further on down the story. It's the mixed multitude. For example, I'll give you a scenario. Joe and Jack are Hebrews and I'm a Gentile, okay? They're Hebrews and I'm a Gentile. My livestock's just been wiped out, but I know these two and we've been friends for a while, right? I don't like fear on myself and I like the Hebrew way of life. I dig these fellas and we've had relationships and friendships for years, so have our families. My livestock gets wiped out, I'm going to go to Joe and Jack say, do us a favour, I have a couple of sheep and a couple of cows, of course you can, brother. These are the same people that came out, the mixed multitude came out with us. Yeah. You know, it didn't just happen on the night of Passover. Yeah, true. They developed relationships and friendships before then, you know. There must have been people thinking, ah, our Pharaoh, it's just like now, our president's sick, I don't listen to him, you know. But you guys, I love the way you live, and the way you want to hear God, I want to be like you. It's the same thing here happening. So I think it's quite a simple explanation of what's happened. The livestock's wiped out. Where are you getting the livestock from? From the friends, the mixed multitude. Sorry, can I just say as well, so the livestock as well, it, in an earlier verse it says about, you know, sacrificing abomination, because there was unclean animals. Yeah. that unclean animals and pigs? Yeah, it, um, it would have been all of them. Yeah. All the cattle, all the animals, yeah. It was man and beast. Thanks, Ange. So Pharaoh's own people were tired of him and his ways. This is part of what's going on with the, the, the Ten Calamities. Just like people in the world today are sick of what's going on in the world around them. This is why I better be a light. Where are they going to go to? They look at the world and say, I, I, this is nonsense, this is madness. We have to be a light to them. They have to come to us for this, you know, to, um, for the truth, for a way out. So these plagues, it's, it's mercy, it's actual mercy every time. It's so that people turn away from the world and toward God to be his people. And we all have friends and family that are in the world, but God's acts of mercy will lead them to us. This is what's been happening in Egypt with Pharaoh. God's acts of mercy led people to God. Verse 12 here. Now most versions says, but the Lord. But it's actually and the Lord. It's and the Lord, not but the Lord. And it's practically the same every time where you see, but it's, it's nearly always and, you know. But once again, these small variations, they make a, just a small variation makes a huge difference in the two meaning. It, it, make, it can make God look like a monster. Pharaoh's trying to do something, but God's done that. No, God just, and God did this. See what I mean? It's a continuation. It's not like Pharaoh wants one thing, but God's doing that to him. No, it's and God. And the Lord, not but. Verse 15. Now, if I had stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, then you would have been cut off from the earth. In other words, God could have wiped out Pharaoh and Egypt like that. <laughs> Just, he made the sun and the stars and the moon. He could have wiped Pharaoh out and his people out like that. Or not, not even like that, just the thought of that. You think, what's all this ten, what's, why didn't he? Well, he tells us in the very next verse, that my name may be declared in all the earth. In his mercy, he gives the whole world access to himself. This is what he's doing. Chance after chance after chance to turn away from the world and to embrace him. 
There's another one here, another slight apologetic. Verse 16. But indeed, for this purpose, I have raised you up. Are you reading it like that? And most English translations say it like that. And it can be very misleading once again. It's as if, like I said, I've made you get born and bred and raised up for, in order, in, so I can treat you like a puppet to show our people how great I am. That's how that can look. But indeed, for this purpose, I've raised you up. And that's what it looks like because of the way it's translated. Now, a true version of that, you'll find it in there, the, the YLT, the Young's Little Translation. You'll obviously find it in the Hebrew also. And yet, for this, I have caused thee to stand. Not raise you up, of course, thee to stand, so as to show thee my power, and for the sake of declaring my name in all the earth. This word, Amad, in the Hebrew, Amad, stand. Only once is this word translated as meaning to raise up. And it's here in this verse, and it makes me wonder why was it... It gives the impression of, like, I allowed you to be born and bred so that I can make myself look wonderful. And that's, once again, it almost portrays God as some kind of monster. Cheating Pharaoh like some kind of puppet on a string. Well, I've made you live so I can do all this with you. No. It's the wrong, it's the wrong, they should, I don't know why they've used it. It's only once is this word translated as meaning that. In over 300 instances, over 300 in scripture, it refers to standing, to being stood. I.e., God allowed him to continue in his wickedness. He allowed him. He remained, he let him remain. Not, he didn't raise him up to be a puppet. He allowed him to continue in his wickedness. Allowed him to remain for the sake of declaring my name in all the earth. The whole dynamic of the meaning is changed just by that little translation. Unless, of course, you check the Hebrew. But the YLT, amongst a couple of others, has it right there. You know, it's the blueprint for why the Lord allows the enemy to continue yeah. so that he can yeah. give us grace and he can actually yeah. resurrect us and redeem exactly us. Exactly the same. That's it's right, the same. It. It's the blueprint. It's the same thing. I think it might be mentioned later, actually. Verse 24. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail. And you're thinking by now, surely Pharaoh's got to just, just bow down here and say, hang on. He's being told it's the finger of God. Now he sees fire and hail mixed. That's impossible. Now this is a blatant miracle. <coughs> water and fire don't mix. Hail is flows in water. Water and fire don't mix. This is a blatant miracle. Undeniable. It's undeniably the work of God. And then later on, of course, after this part, you see the air gushing in sunlight for three days, day and night, and then Egypt's plunged into darkness. These are blatant miracles that he's still just... Would, would not bow, would not humble, would not acknowledge God. So, you think, how far beyond redemption has Pharaoh gone to ignore such signs and wonders? How far has he gone? And then we conclude near the end of the passage here, 9, 34 and 5. When Pharaoh saw that the rain, the hail and the thunder had ceased, by the way, that thunder, it, it's literally translated voices of, voice of God, voices of God. He sinned yet more. And he, he hardened his heart, he and his servants. It's like the fallen one, isn't it? And the third of the angels that went with him. So the heart of Pharaoh was hard, neither would he let the children of Israel go, as the Lord had spoken by Moses. So where it says harden his heart, once again, it was heavy. He's made it heavy. It's kabad, it's this verb, kabad. He's made it heavy. It's about that, bro, because if you look at the translation for Janus and Jamborees, which are the two magicians in Egypt, yeah. as Paul quotes, yeah. it, they translate as vexed rebel, and Hasatan and his masquerade, he's the vexed rebel that's heard the voice, the thunder of God, but still sins yet more and hardens his heart further and speaks about his servants who are the, the vexed rebels. Beautiful, come against beautiful. The exactly the same scenario. Beautiful, thanks brother. So the heart of Pharaoh was hard, neither would he let the children of Israel go, as the Lord has spoken by Moses. So what's happened here? Pharaoh's heart is again honoured. God has honoured 
Pharaoh, Pharaoh's desires. Pharaoh makes it heavy. God strengthens his desire. But what comes out here is that Pharaoh, like Hasatan, is a liar and a deceiver. You remember verses 27 and 28, if you look in your Bibles. Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Adam and said to them, I've sinned this time, the Lord is righteous, my people and I are wicked. And cheat the Lord, there may be no more mighty thundering and hail, for it's enough. I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. And then he says, the heart of Pharaoh was hard, neither would let the children of Israel go, as the Lord has spoken by Moses. He's a liar and a deceiver. Just wanted to make that point before we continue. Now, as I've gone through this past, I've tried to portray that, for me, Hasatan is the devil incarnate. And people might say, well, wasn't he just an evil man? Well, he was that as well. But besides the comparisons I've already laid out, that there are more. If you think we spoke on the break of Revelation, the book of Revelation, now if you think of Revelation 12, we've got the dragon who's pursuing God's firstborn Israel. Remember the book of Revelation? The dragon is pursuing God's firstborn Israel. Now remember in Exodus 4, God tells Moses to inform Israel that Israel is his son, his firstborn. So here you have it in Revelation 12, which continues with God's chosen in the wilderness. God's chosen being saved by the blood of the Lamb. And then we see references to waters, which is mirror down Nile in this episode here. Revelation 12 looks like a rerun of the whole God, Pharaoh, Egypt, Israel scenario. If you're, not, if you're not read it or you want confirmation, please in your own time, um, as you're going through this passage, refer to Revelation 12. The whole episode with the dragon, the devil, is a striking resemblance to Pharaoh, what we're reading about today. And also, was he just an evil man? Was he the devil? If you think of the book of Ezekiel, we read of the king of Tyre, remember? Now he's just a man. The king of Tyre is a man, he's just a man. And yet he's referred to in terms of being Hasatan himself. If not physically, like Pharaoh, at least spiritually, at least. But for me, he's the devil incarnate. Ezekiel 28. In Ezekiel 28, it starts off discussing uh, the character of the king of Tyre, the man. And then as it progresses, the details develop into nuances that no longer describe a human heathen king, but the nature of a spiritual entity at work within, within him. So 28, 13 and 14. So God, through Ezekiel, begins by addressing the king of Tyre, the man, and then it proceeds like this. You were the seal of perfection. You remember he's talking to the man, the king of Tyre. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz and diamond, beryl, onyx and jasper, sapphire, turquoise and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. So he's talking to a man, and yet he's just, that's Hasatan. That's Hasatan. So I propose that, like, a man can be the devil incarnate, such as Pharaoh and such as the king of Tyre here. If the king of Tyre, a man can be Hasatan, then so can Pharaoh. Now, interestingly, there's something deeper here, and it regards the gemstones. The stones listed here as a dawn in Hasatan, by the way. Scriptures already seen it in the Torah in Exodus. Exodus 28 lists the uh, the precious gems that uh, adorn the, the high the high priest's ephod. Right? And you think, well, hang on. So Satan's got them and the high priest has got them. And you might at first you think that you feel a bit uneasy or uncomfortable with that. You think that how can that be right? But there is a difference. There's three gemstones missing. With here, has a time, there's three gemstones missing. There's, and they're called in Hebrew, the Shem, Shavol, and Achlamah. So therefore, he only has nine, 
while 12 are on, the, on God's high priest, on the ephod. Now I'm going to look at one of them. If you look at the meaning of one of these stones in Hebrew, we find something that's quite revealing. It's Shabal. One of the three that's missing, Shabal. It's a gemstone. It's, people don't know, really know what kind of gemstone it is, but the guess is it's, it's, it's agate. So Shabal. One of the gemstones missing that adorned Hasatan. And then it's related to this word Shub. It's the same letters which means to repent, to turn back, to repent. Now, when you see the pictograph of these letters, Shin and Beit, the first two letters of this gemstone, the Shin is a picture of two front teeth, which represents pressing, and the Beit is a picture of a tent. We've gone back to the pictograph of Hebrew here. Tent is a place of dwelling, a place that you return to, a turning back or away from something or someone. A captive is one that's turned away from a, pla a place of dwelling. The meanings of these words, shin and bait, can be to sit, to rest, to dwell. It can also mean capture, captive, repent, return, return home. Mm -hmm. Hasatan is his own captive. He can't return to his tent, mm -hmm. to his first estate. He cannot repent. He hasn't got it. It's missing from him. He's a prisoner of his own hatred. He steals the Israelites' free will and then loses his own. After all said and done, God will give you the desires of your own heart. For me, Pharaoh, like Hasatan, is beyond redemption. And one might say, well, it wasn't fair to leave Hasatan with three stones missing in the first place. You and your God. I turn around and say, no, God would surely have added three stones if, if it weren't for the devil's own evil intent. Because he was perfect until iniquity, he had iniquity within him, was found within him. Remember the earlier quote, as I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. but that the wicked turn from his way and live. He wouldn't turn, he wouldn't turn, self-inflicted. God is just, Psalm 7. God is a just judge, and God is angry with the wicked every day. If he, and that includes Pharaoh and all his cronies, doesn't turn back, like repent, he will sharpen his sword. He bends his bow and makes it ready. He also prepares for himself instruments of death. He give it like he take it away. He makes his arrows into fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked brings forth iniquity. Yes, he conceives trouble and brings forth falsehood. Here's the key. He made a pit and dug it out and has fallen into the ditch which he made. You dig your own pit. His trouble shall return upon his own head and his violent dealing shall come down on all his on his own crown. I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. God is just, righteous and loving. He gives us chance after chance. This is what the plagues were all about. Job 33. Behold, God works all these things twice, in fact, three times with a man. Pharaoh got ten chances. To bring back his soul from the pit, that he might be enlightened with the light of life. Pharaoh, like anyone else, had the option to choose his own path through his God-given free will. Either way, God's will will be done. Okay, so to conclude, and what are the lessons for us from the Parsha? God rules. God rules. Over all the false deities, as we've seen, with the ten signs and wonders, all were the easiest false gods. He popped them off one by one, one by one. The god of the water, the god of the air, the god of the land. One by one, popped them all off. He also rules all the elements, everything that we know that exists. Earth, wind, fire and water. The heavens and the earth and the waters, everything. He's ruler over it all. He shows you that in the, with these signs and wonders. 
if you look through all the, the plagues, it's all related to earth, wind, fire and water, not just the false deities, but earth, wind, fire and water, everything we know in existence. <coughs> he says, I am the God of it all. It's, it's me, I am over all this, it's me. All the elements, everything. Now Pharaoh knew this, but he wouldn't admit that it was the finger of God. Our God rules supreme, not any earthbound ruler. Yod Hey Vav Hey is the sole sovereign of heaven and earth. Through the signs and the wonders, the world has shown that our God rules everything in the air, everything that lives in the air, everything in the water, everything that lives in the water, everything on the land, and everything that lives upon the land. He rules light and dark, he rules day and night, he rules life and death. It's all in the signs and wonders. It's Otot and Mofetim. Let us worship our God in the way that he desires. Do not let the world dilute our worship of God. Even if and when the situation gets worse before it gets better, because it will. We know from the book of Revelation that many of these events that happened in Egypt foreshadow what's to come. We're just ready. Let us worship God in the way he desires. Do not let, let the world dilute our worship of God. Love God, love your neighbour as yourself. Remain God-fearing, selfless and humble. Remember the criteria. Put your faith in Messiah in his two advents, in the Torah and in the prophets. We will overcome the pharaohs of this world and we will dwell with our God. That's Pasha Vaera. Have a blessed week. Vaya con Dios and Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom.